Awesome. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Corey. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and I am one of the program coordinators here with Daily Acts. Um, I know many of you may be familiar with the work that Daily Acts is doing. Um, I do see some new faces and for the new folks that are tuning in, I would love to give just a brief um, welcoming hello and just tell you a little bit about who we are as an organi organization, what we stand for and what we do and why. One second, here we go. Um, we are a holistic, uh, a holistic based environmental nonprofit that inspires transformative, uh, informative act, sorry, transformative action that creates connected, equitable and climate resilient communities. Uh, we believe in the power of our daily actions to create um, positive impacts of change so we can continue to reconnect people to self, to our community and to place. Um, we believe that in return, this helps to heal both our society and our planet. We have a three-pronged approach for doing that, that starts in, the, uh, starts in the soil and swells into culture and policy change. Um, and this looks kind of like what we're doing tonight. At uh, first, we spread solution and models. We offer programs much like this one that we're offering here tonight. So we'd like to extend offerings uh, for people to have skills and tools to grow their own food, and medicine, and habitat, um, to help to conserve water and other resources to help to live uh, more enriched lives while having a positive impact on the planet. Because we recognize that meaningful change happens with collaboration, we also invest in community leadership um, through our network and alliances seen through our Leadership Institute for Just and Resilient Communities, our youth-led um, organizations and leadership programs like Eco to School, and our Environmental Health Coalition. Lastly, we believe in mobilizing our community power to help to build um, public and political will for climate and justice policy. Uh, so over the last 20 years, we have had uh, a lot of far and wide impact, um, but everything that we do really starts with what we're doing here tonight, which is gathering together in community to talk about things that we care about um, and to collaborate with ideas and dreams and to make our community feel more resilient, more equitable, more beautiful, and to help one another heal. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and jump on in. We have a really exciting um, program on garden design for you all tonight that Connor and I will both be um, facilitating. Um, before we jump in, there's just a little house rules um, and etiquette that we would ask for you all. Um, if you have any questions, we love them. We encourage them. Um, you can go ahead and use the uh, chat box and ask your questions. Um, either Connor and I will do our best to answer them or we will save them um, at the end because we have a, a time saved for Q&A. Um, if there is a really great question that we think would be beneficial and there's a good stopping point, we can address it um, there in the moment. But all other questions will be answered or saved um, for the end. And then uh, just make sure that when you are doing your chat that it's set for everyone. Um, probably more than likely another person in the webinar has the same type of question as you. Um, and there is no silly questions. We encourage them all. We're all at different stages and this is an inclusive and safe space. So thank you so much. And a little bit about the outline for our time together in our evening is we're gonna jump in and go over how do we create observations um, from there, how do we design um, base maps, all the site factors and sectors, transitioning into soil health, and then designing raised beds and plans. Uh, we will we'll enjoy a visualization exercise, um, uh, going over then how to select plants, and lastly, going over some design examples. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Connor. Thank you, Corey. If you could uh, watch the waiting room for me um, until I pass it back, that'd be great. 
And really quick, my name is Connor Devane. I'm also programs coordinator with Daily Acts. I use he, him pronouns. I'm really excited to talk with you all about garden design. So the very first step in the design process is in my opinion, far and away the most important one. And it's a really valuable skill to hone over time and that's observation. So I really like this quote from Toby Hemingway who wrote the book Gaia's Garden, a guide to home scale permaculture and who actually used to teach uh, Daily Act's permaculture design certification course um, before he passed a few years ago. So no human designed an alpine meadow, a tropical forest, or a creekside grotto, yet these wild landscapes are never ugly. They follow a larger natural order that seems to ensure beauty. And so I would go even further than that. You know, beauty is not the only criterion we're looking for. Natural landscapes, when they're healthy, they're self-regulating, they thrive, and they exhibit balance. And we want all those things for our gardens, too. So this quote um, really emphasizes the key to using observation as a tool, which is modeling your systems after nature. And that's really the North Star of a permaculture mindset, which some of you may already be familiar with, some may not. So it's, it's a big topic, but at its core, permaculture is a design framework um, of observing and modeling systems after nature. It's centered on connections, relationships, and patterns. So where do we start? I find it's helpful to start at the macro and then go to the micro, going from patterns down to details. So if we wanna create a healthy little ecosystem in our garden, um, or maybe you manage a, a bigger area of land, you know, there are some macro scale considerations that you really can't ignore. Things like what's the climate where you live? When do the rains come? How, how much rain do you get? How does the sun move across your landscape based on where on the globe you find yourself? How do conditions change with the seasons? What plants can thrive where you live and which would like, likely not? Um, there are some helpful designations for some of these larger scale considerations that you can find really easily just by searching online, like um, USDA hardiness zones and sunset zones that nurseries uh, will label plants as to help you make your choices. Um, here in Sonoma County, we're mostly in USDA uh, hardiness zone 9B, which means temperatures of like the lowest temperature being 25 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and then sunset zone 14, which is a little more complicated to explain, but it's good to know what zone you're in. Um, Observation is just a little bit more on that one, Corey, thanks. Um, such a critical tool, most permaculture designers would actually recommend spending an entire year observing your site before you intervene because ecosystems are dynamic, they change over time. But I imagine most of us here don't really want to wait a whole year before diving in. We probably wanna get things moving this spring. That's totally fine. But I would encourage you to think about the intention behind that year of observation as you move through the design process and as you interact with your garden over time. How are things changing with the seasons? Uh, how can you design your garden to work with those changes rather than against them? So just when you're out there walking your garden, look at what's currently growing. You maybe have some ornamental plants, maybe like a stand of redwoods or a turf lawn. How is your landscape trying to grow? What's happening that you're either fighting against or that's happening without your influence? You know, what, uh, what would it, this landscape have looked like before development? What are the relationships between your plants and insects, birds and other wildlife? So that's more of this, this micro scale. There's really no detail too big or too small because the more tuned in you are to your garden, the more informed your choices are going to be and the more that garden is gonna thrive. So I wanna spend a minute or two talking about patterns that exist beyond the boundaries of your garden. And these are called sectors. So sectors are basically just patterns that intersect with your garden. 
So there's a really uh, good simple example. It may not look simple at first glance, but here on top, um, we've got someone's little map of their garden and they've marked out with these arcs, how the sun crosses their site throughout the day at different times of year. So they've got one path for at the summer equinox or the summer solstice and one at the winter solstice. And I think they've got, it's a little small on my screen, but maybe the um, spring and fall equinox in there as well. They've marked wind direction. They're using these blue areas here are representing how water flows on the landscape and where it pools. Um, They've also marked out how humans move through the site. So these are all considerations that are gonna be really valuable to you when you're making choices about what you're planting where or where you're putting structures or other features like a seating area or something. Um, and you can go a lot further into depth with this. You can take note of maybe there are deer that use your garden like a highway or you live next to a busy road and you know that the traffic noise is coming from one direction or you have a really beautiful view, what we would call a view shed off to like the Southwest of your, of your property. These are things that you wanna take note of so that you're not you know, planting a massive oak tree that blocks that view. When you're doing this level of observation, it's a lot of information to keep track of. Um, so as you might guess, based on this picture we have here with the map, um, we're gonna talk about some ways to keep track of that information. So the first thing that I recommend is to just carry a little notebook with you anytime you're in the garden and just taking note of observations. Even if you just have one raised bed and you're growing only tomatoes, it's good to note like, oh, the tomatoes grow better on this side of my bed or you know, my, you're just noting changes that happen over time. But the second recommendation is you're gonna want to make a map. And Corey, if we could go to the, thank you. So we call this a base map. And what we're looking at here is close to as simple as you can get with a base map. So we've got our structures marked, we've got the house and the garage, we've got our hardscapes, um, and we've got a few e existing trees and uh, compass arrow showing us which direction is north. This might be all that you need for your purposes, but you may wanna go into further detail, taking note and drawing out the features like those that are listed on the screen. Or you know, maybe you have a creek or a pond on site that you want to be sure to include. You'll find that having a base map to use is a really, really valuable tool. You can do so much with it. Once you have your, your base map, um, you can use that to create lots of layers to do something like a sector analysis like we saw in the previous slide or to do different iterations of design as you're trying on different ideas and seeing what might work and keep those from year to year. So you know, oh, I planted you know, a bunch of bulbs, maybe like Pacific iris in this area and now they're underground and I don't remember where exactly I put them, but I looked at my base map and I can see that it's this exact spot that I planted those irises. So it's really, really valuable, lots and lots of uses. And there are lots of ways to make it, uh, make a base map. So I'm going to quickly walk us through a basic example of making a base map. And I'm going to use um, a software program called SketchUp because that's just what's easiest to do in a, a webinar like this. But one of the most common ways um, to draw a base map follows the same idea, but you would use uh, tracing paper or even just printer paper or notebook paper if you have enough light. So I'm going to take over the screen share here really quickly. So you can see, uh, Corey, can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing SketchUp? No, okay, let me try that again. How about now? 
I don't, but let me maybe stop my share real fast. We can see it. You oh, can see okay. it? Okay. I just can't. Okay. <laughs> as long as you can see it. Okay. So I'm what I'm going to do here is import a picture of a screenshot that I took from the program Google Earth. You can do this on Google Maps as well so that you don't have to download anything, but Google Earth is a free program you can download. Really fun to play around with and it gives you really high quality satellite images. So others are having trouble viewing. I think Corey has to give up her sharing in okay. order for everybody to see Connor's. Okay, thank you. How about that? Can you see that now? Thumbs up, yes. Manny. Yeah. Yes, it's okay. better now. Okay, awesome. Okay. Thank now, you, everyone. This is what's good about meeting format rather than web format. I appreciate the help. Um, okay, so so what we're looking at, um, I just chose a random house at Aluma, this example. So if you go onto either Google Maps or Google Earth, you type in your address and use satellite view, you're going to get this wonderful to use this software, which is not free, and hopefully my internet will cooperate. Um, SketchUp is competing with Zoom here. Um, but you would print this out and lay tracing paper or any kind of paper on top, and you would just draw out the important features. So I'm going to start here with the property lines. And I'm going to go pretty rough here, just for example's sake. I would draw out my structure. Again, not trying to be exact. Maybe the driveway. And at its simplest, this is what we're looking at. We might mark, okay, we have a tree here that's going to cast shade. And then if we want, we can delete the satellite image. And this is a very hastily drawn but acceptable <laughs> base map. And you know, we would probably want to capture the good thing, something I like about Google Earth over maps is it does give you your compass bearing and a scale. So I'm going to I'm going to end my share. If you could start again, Corey, and talk about how you can scale a map and a few other methods for making a base map. That work. Can you see my screen? I see your screen. Uh, you might. I think you want to go into presenter mode. Let's, I see my presenters on. Um, I'm seeing like next slide and notes. And to answer the question in the chat, yes, we will be sending this recording out in a follow-up email and we'll also be um, posting it to our website with where you can find all of our other recorded webinars as well. But we'll send it out um, in the coming days so that you can see anything that you miss. All right, so if we can go to the next slide real quick. So, that, I mean, that was a very quick glance at one way of making a base map. Kind of the tried and true method is the tape measure and grid paper, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Maybe there's an existing map of the property, maybe the previous homeowner or whoever owns the property you rent happens to have a base map that you can use. Um, and they might just have the aerial photo that you could trace like we talked about. Um, if you have a drone or you know someone who does, they could take an aerial photo. And then there's always the option of hiring a design firm to make a base map for you. This is certainly not uh, the DIY free option, but it's going to ensure that you have a really, really accurate map, uh, which can be really helpful, especially if you're looking at making a really sophisticated design plan. So maybe you don't want to use the computer at all. You want to do it 
in a way that gets you out in the landscape and you're making observations while you're out there. You can do the tape measure and graph method. Uh, there we go. So you're, you probably already know what I'm about to say for how to do this. Uh, it's as simple as measuring the features of your landscape and getting a piece of graph paper and figuring out a scale. So, you know, if you've got, if you figured out that each little square on your graph paper is going to represent two feet and you've got a wall on your house that is 20 feet long, you've got 10 squares. And so it's really um, whatever works best for you. The important thing is just to, to make one. And again, it could be a piece of paper that you haven't measured anything precisely, but it's enough for you to have a sense of where everything is on your landscape. All right, so unavowed base maps. Uh, pass it back to additional concept. Perfect timing. I think your Wi-Fi is starting Ooh. to get a little tired. <laughs> um, well, of course, like once we got, uh, once we have an idea of what we're going to be shaping with our landscape, um, we need to start thinking about how we're going to get started. And we start really from the ground up. Healthy plants really only become as healthy as they can by having healthy soil. Um, and I really <laughs> believe in uh, this quote said by Franklin D. Roosevelt that the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Um, having healthy soil, one, helps to put nutrients back into the soil. You help to create an ecosystem that thrives and creates biodiversity, um, helps to create uh, the soil food web for a bunch of uh, microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, worms, creepy crawlies to kind of move within this network, these channels, within this like really spongy, healthy, vibrant soil that we're creating. Um, and healthy soil also helps to conserve water, helps to sink it and to store it. Um, and it also helps to uh, car sink carbon and take it out of the atmosphere and place it back into the soil. And so um, many of us might be asking like, well, what type of soil health, uh, what type of so health is my soil, how to get started and um, how can I test it? Um, and so there's a various different methods that you can try. This is one of them called a percolization test. Um, you know, part of creating healthy soil is knowing what type that you have. Uh, many people here in Sonoma County probably are working with uh, clay or clay loam soil. Um, and this help, uh, excuse me, this test helps so we can see um, what plants are going to thrive with this, um, this environment um, and maybe how much you're going to need to amend your soil if you're wanting to put in specific plants, um, right? Maybe you have like a really clay uh, soil surface that you're working with, so you might need to amend it a little bit more um, versus if you have really sandy soil. Um, if this is something that tickles your curiosity and you would like to perform your own test, you can go onto our website and we have some resources available for how to conduct your own percolization test um, on your landscape. Uh, something a little bit more um, maybe practical or easy is to go outside and um, just get your hands into the earth. Um, and this is called a ribbon test. Um, this is where you go in and you should probably wet your soil to make it pretty wet or moist. Um, and then to be, you wanna to begin to like massage the dirt to make it into this ribbon. And if it crumbles really quickly, then more than likely you have uh, sandy soil, which people in our West County residents um, have higher sand levels in their yards. Um, and if you are able to massage the soil and you're able to see that it makes probably about like a 2.5 to five centimeter, uh, centimeter ribbon, then more than likely you have loam soil um, or clay loam soil. And this is a really great way to test on the spot, not needing to get any other resources or tools. Um, and it's really accessible. And we also have this resource on our website if you're curious about this as well. 
Once you know what soil that you're working with, um, then we can kind of begin to transition into prepping your canvas, right? Um, you know how you need to amend it and you'll go ahead and begin this process um, of edging the edge, uh, edging the edging the edges of your landscape um, or the outline that you're going to want to create. Um, and we, I recommend that you do this process before you lay out the cardboard and the mulching. Um, mulching is a really great way to suppress any weeds. It's also a really great way to help to um, cover any irrigation and to conserve water to sink it into um, the soil. It also decomposes material and help creates healthier organic matter, um, which in return creates healthier plants. It's also really um, aesthetically pleasing and there's um, a variety of different mulches that you can select from. Um, mulching as well can save up to 12 to 25 gallons um, and we love that, especially here in Sonoma County. Um, in Petaluma, Petaluma, we're still in a stage four drought, so any little bit helps. Um, and so by edging, you're creating or carving out a ditch um, along the boundary line that you would like to have. So maybe that's um, between a pavement or um, the sidewalk. And this um, helps to suppress weeds and it also helps to allow the, the mulch so it doesn't fall into the ditch or doesn't over, excuse me, overflow into the grass or sidewalk. Oh, sorry, wow, that really went deep. Um, after you've done your edging, you'll go ahead and lay about two layers thick of cardboard. Um, you can do about one, in, um, after that, you'll do about one inch of compost. Uh, one thing about cardboard that you can do is a uh, like grab and grow, there's, you can get layers of rolls of cardboard or you can upcycle up any cardboard material that you have, um, it's really helpful. And then after that, you'll mulch and then begin your planting afterwards. And we also have resources on our website if any of you are curious about this as well and would like to learn more about the prepping your canvas and mulching or any of these other following steps. Great. And this transitions us into how to create raised beds. Um, a lot of us, I know for myself, I'm, I'm a renter and so I don't fully have the capacity to redesign my entire landscape or backyard, whether that's space, whether that's finances or being a renter, not a homeowner. Uh, being able to control a little <laughs> micro or, or a little ecosystem in my backyard is something that's so really important to me because I love to garden um, and it helps to keep it contained. Um, raised beds also help if you have poor soil health. You get more control over the health of your soil um, that you want to grow your plants within. Um, it is um, more contained as well and it's really great um, if you don't have space. Um, and it helps to also uh, helps with any pest management that you might have. Um, a pest that we have here is a cat. And so we've had to like build a cage over a raised bed. Um, but if you have any mice or other, other rodents like um, groundhogs or gophers, this helps to mediate some of those pro problems that you might have in your gardens. I also think that raised beds are really aesthetically beautiful. Um, and when you get started with your raised beds, um, it's really important to write everything out and to document it. Uh, don't trust your memory. You might think that you'll remember it next season, um, but then the next season comes or the next year and you might forget like, oh, what did I grow? Or what did I have problems with? Um, so it's really important to collect the data that you're, you are creating and knowing how um, your garden wants to grow in the ways that might need to be amended. Um, for example, I love this picture here. We have tomatoes um, that uses a lot of nitrogen within the soil. And so you might wanna plant green beans or other materials to help to naturally amend the soil and put uh, nitrogen back in. Um, and that's gonna help to seasonally plant and work with our gardens in a more holistic and natural um, sequencing. 
<laughs> and I will say garden amnesia is a real thing. Um, and so this is part of the base mapping as process as well and creating the structure and the outline so that you're setting yourself up for success and, and your garden as well. So we're gonna just go over how to get started, right? You wanna pick an ideal location, um, pick a spot that you're actually gonna wanna go to. You might not want to put it all the way at the opposite end of the garden, because um, after a long day, it might feel less motivating to go out there and to do some gardening. So. Maybe you kind of want it close to your kitchen because you're going to be wanting to plant some yummy herbs that you want to go out and quickly grab like some parsley or basil or rosemary um, and take it back to your kitchen to cook with. Um, this is also really ideal too to think about the location because of watering. Um, you know, maybe you're going to be using a watering hose or a spigot, so you might not want to walk all the way to the other end of your property and you want something pretty convenient. Um, maybe you're using a garden hose, you want to remember to like wheel it back up if you're going to be doing any mowing or any other aspects like that too. So it's really important to consider all of your surroundings. Um, and then from there you transition into what is the ground level that you're working with, right? You want to make sure that everything is really level regardless of the condition of your soil, right? Because maybe there's going to be some erosion, erosion or compact. Um, we'll go into that a little bit when we go over the length of the bed. Um, but as things decompose, we're going to be working with that soil level. So if it's topsy-turvy, then that might be problematic when it comes to the building stage. Um, and that building stage kind of already went over irrigation and watering. Um, when you begin to build, uh, I would recommend about 12 to 18 inches. It's pretty ideal. You can go as low as six inches, um, but this is the um, kind of the sweet number that it's going to be as easy um, to work with and most productive. Um, most root uh, feeder roots are in the first six inches and then past that, um, the shoots begin to get a little bit taller and a little less manageable. Um, and then if you go past the 18 inches, um, this is going to cause more structural issues down the road due to the weight and the pressure of all the soil. So the sweet spot is going to be between uh, 12 to 18 inches. Um, and this is going to be really helpful too when you're considering height is to think about what different crops you're going to be wanting to put into your raised beds um, in the space that you're going to be needing. You know, root vegetables are going to require more space, whereas herbs are going to require less. Um, and then if you put um, just more heavy compacted plants or shrubs, that's also going to um, shrink the soil. So you might need to be needing to interact with your soil a little bit more frequently. Um, as for width, uh, we recommend doing about four feet. That's pretty perfect. This allows room for flexibility and spacing for rows. Um, and it's really important that um, you're able to kind of reach into the bed with your body without having to step in because that can damage the soil and plants. Um, you wanna be able to make sure that you can work your bed um, and amend or weed or any other things that you're gonna need to be doing. And for length, um, whatever fits your needs, you could do four by four squares or four by 12 or 20 rows. Um, Kind of this is where you get to dream into the space and see um, what you're wanting and what it's going to fit your vision for the space. Um, and this is also where you can begin to get a little creative with it is the shape. Um, you can build squares, rectangles, T-shapes, circles, ovals. Um, as long as you can reach uh, all areas of the bed while staying within the edge, uh, you're good to go. One of my favorite raised beds that I love to recommend to people is Culture. Um, this is a century old uh, traditional way of building garden beds from rotten logs or plant debris. And this is a really great way to naturally amend your soil. Uh, it helps to conserve water and recycle rotten logs or debris that you might otherwise throw away. Um, you start by laying all the debris at the bottom and then with like sticks leaves and straws, working your way up to the compost and topsoil. And as you begin to, to plant, um, things naturally decompose. And all that material breaks down to create really enriched, healthy organic matter that creates healthier plants. 
and you can continue to create rotations and that creates a really vibrant ecosystem. Um, I'll show you this pretty fun video that I made. This is, uh, I, I live in Oakland and so this is my raised bed in my backyard. Um, and I went ahead and went for a walk in my neighborhood and there's a lot of people that are utilizing the spaces in their yards by creating raised beds within their front yards that people can enjoy. They have some yummy kale, lots of collards. This is uh, someone in my neighborhood that has quite a variety of different raised beds. They just started planting some new lettuces. They have like a trough that they've been making. This is a kind of communal uh, garden that they ha someone has in their front yard where a bunch of neighbors come collectively together. And I love showing this example too, because uh, this woman here, she uses a lot of pots because she uh, can't put things in the soil and the ground. And I think that's a really great alternative to show to people um, that shows a range of things that you can have in your garden. Um, and you don't have to be limited, whether that's with space or money or other um, factors. Thanks. Right, and so as we begin to kind of create um, observations and creating ideas, I think that this is a really um, nice stopping point to kind of begin to let that information saturate and sink into us, um, but not really lose what your dreams are for your space. And um, I'd love to lead everyone through a visualization exercise um, and kind of to, if you feel as, that it's safe to do so, you can close your eyes. And I love for you all to just like picture yourself being in your space and to really see what you're gonna be working with. Um, maybe you're a renter here tonight and this is a really great opportunity to dream big, so what's, what is the big pie in the sky dream? And once you have a home or um, a place that you can collaborate, maybe collectively in a co-op or environment that you wanna thrive in or build, what does that look like? Um, and so if it feels good, you can go ahead and close your eyes. I'll close mine with you. Um, and you can really sink into my voice and sink into the space um, and begin to think about what it is that you wanna be creating. When you close your eyes and you place yourself within your garden and your landscape, maybe you can think about what season it is, what's growing, what are the colors that are surrounding you? Is your garden going to be a place where you can go and relax and meditate and recharge? Or is it a place that you go for inspiration and you wanna feel energized and so maybe you have like a lot of bright colors. Maybe you want to create a habitat to invite critters and life to your yard. Maybe it's a place for animals or for children to play. Thinking about all of the layout of the land, you can start to put your vision and your taste into what you what, what you want to enjoy and what you want to see. And take like an extra minute or so to wrap up what you feel that you will enjoy and what you want to see and part of the documentation process is to write it down afterwards and to track your dreams just as much as you're going to be tracking the land feels good. Take one deep breath with me. You can open your eyes. So go ahead and pass it to Connor as he leads us through um, how do we begin to design and put some of those dreams that we have into the land and how do we select the plants that we want. Thank you, Corey. Um, can we actually start with the, the Petaluma Library slide instead? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Oh, I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I do. I have a lot of ideas for changes to make uh, in my garden and 
it's always fun to, to step into that sort of visualization imagination space. So that was something that uh, someone who used to work at Daily Axe did a few years ago uh, at the Petaluma Library, which had previously been just turf lawn uh, and is now my favorite of Daily Axe model site gardens. So before we jump into the nitty gritty of plant selection and other design considerations, um, I just wanna invite you to take a look at these two pictures and share in the chat anything that you notice that you're seeing, what's standing out to you. What do you like? Where are your eyes drawn? Do you notice anything about the various plants you see, like their sizes, their colors, textures? Yeah, just no wrong answers, whatever stands out. Color, differing heights. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Shrubs, so mm -hmm. less work. Yeah, I love as as um, our program director likes to say, shrub it up. You know, you can fill a lot of space and shade out a lot of weeds with shrubs. And they do a really good job of sequestering carbon. Um, just give it one more chance if anybody else wants to share something. The walkway allows you a clear path for being in the space. Absolutely. And for me, the walkway really draws my eyes that direction. You can't really see in this photo, but um, next to this wonderful Pakistani mulberry tree that we have, which is prolific and creates the most delicious fruit um, in late spring, I highly recommend visiting. Um, we have some benches and a seating area, uh, kind of a focal point in the garden. Um, I see someone called out the, the great differences in color. Yeah, absolutely. So those are, those are things that I'm noticing too, and they bring to mind um, this concept of anchoring features. So an anchoring feature is a great place to start if you aren't sure where to start, especially if you've done sheet mulching, you've got that blank canvas that can be really intimidating. Um, Corey, I know my internet's been off, but um, there, if we can go back to the, the anchor slide. There we go, thank you. Um, an anchoring feature is just a focal point. It's an element in your garden that draws the eye and sometimes even like demands attention, right? These are elements that we design around. So they can be things that already exist in your garden. Like maybe you've got a really beautiful manzanita that you want to highlight with the way that you plant the rest of the landscape, or they can be things that you bring in specifically for that purpose. Um, so in our examples here, we've got like the walkway, uh, we've got a tree as kind of a foundation plant here on the left. In the middle, we've got another walkway of flagstone and then a fountain and then a seating area on the right. And when you're working with something like a seating area, you have kind of the opportunity to approach it from both directions. It can be something that is an anchor feature in itself. You know, you're plant designing your garden in a way that makes it look like a really inviting place to sit so that some you walk into the garden or maybe, you know, someone comes to visit you and they walk in and like, I wanna sit there. And then when you sit down, you have an anchor feature in the view from that seat. Um, you know, maybe you walk out your back door and the pathway leads you to a couple garden chairs. You sit down and you see a fountain like we have in this middle uh, example here. So other, other things you could consider are um, arches or trellises and retaining walls, really playing with the, the like different planes and different height elements. So, once you have an idea of where you're trying to draw the eye, if you wanna take that approach, which I like, cause you can have a really beautiful garden that's beautiful everywhere you look. But um, to me, it's, I like to almost tell a story with a landscape and anchor features help. Um, but once you've decided on whether you wanna work with those or not, um, we get into the concept of selecting plants, which can be really overwhelming um, but also really fun. 
Um, we have a couple sort of filter criteria that make it a lot simpler and can kind of help prevent the overwhelm. So there's a concept in permaculture design. It's not exclusive to permaculture by any means, but it's stacking functions. And in general, the idea in a permaculture garden is any plant that you plant in your garden should be you know, providing at least three functions. And those can be features that are inherent to the plant itself, or they can be situational. So for example, a plant is water wise because of the plant that it is, but it could provide shade situationally. So we look at these five on screen as sort of our, our big five. You know, we want plants that are water wise. I know a lot of people mentioned drought tolerance uh, in our poll earlier. We love it if plants can provide habitat for insects, birds, other wildlife. It's great if they produce an edible yield for those food forest folks in particular. Uh, they can provide medicine. And of course, the subjective one, we want them to be beautiful. So at a bare minimum, when I'm working on a landscape, I want to see at least two of these big five for any plant that I'm working in. Um, if you can find plants that fit all five criteria, even better. Um, but again, this is just sort of like our first step of filtering down options. There are so, so many other benefits um, that you'll start to notice more and more as you deepen into that thoughtful observation practice. I mean, a plant can be providing, like I mentioned, shading. It can be a privacy screen or even a fence to keep maybe deer out or just to border the end sides of your property. It can mine nutrients from the soil. It could repel um, you know, creatures we might call pests and it can attract beneficial insects, fix nitrogen, timber, fiber. It can have a lovely fragrance. There's really so many different considerations which is why we offer these five to make it a little simpler. Um, and there, when we're talking about the beauty side of things, um, well, actually really for all of these categories, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pass it back to Corey to go into a little more detail. Thanks, Connor. Um, a few characteristics that we're gonna look at is uh, being water wise. I know that's a lot of people's concern and motivation when selecting plants for their garden. Um, right? There's water-wise and there's non-water-wise. Um, most of us here in Sonoma County, we're pretty <laughs> familiar with um, what's going on within the climate crisis and how planting is affected by, um, by water and also how plants that have water can have a little bit more success. And so when you can help your yard by selecting plants that might need, ha that have been adapted over the years to be drought tolerant, then you're setting yourself and your yard um, in the landscape for success. Um, and you also just, you don't need me to tell you <laughs> uh, why it's important to have water-wise plants anymore besides that. Um, here we have some characteristics. So here on the left, uh, my left, we have um, some that are water-wise, the one on the right. Um, those are gonna be a little bit more uh, water thirsty. They're less likely to conserve water and draw. they draw uh, more water um, from our aquifers um, or from the soil. Um, when you choose uh, specifically uh, here in California, we have a Mediterranean climate uh, those, that climate has been adapted throughout the years to um, be resilient for a drier, um, less, needing to use less water, um, and it also helps when you put native plants um, in the soil, helps to restore native fungi that also lives um, within the, the habitat um, within the soil. And so some examples for uh, native plants and non-native um, my rule of thumb is if you can go with a native plant, that is probably your best because you can, like Connor said, stack functions. Um, and it's a really great uh, ally, I'd say, to have within the ecosystem that you're creating. Um, if it is a species that has adapted to that region or ecosystem, um, it is 
has been adapted to be equipped to handle the, the rainfall pattern, uh, the soil, the wind, um, and it's even co-adapted with other species to create a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, of course, there are other wonderful alternatives that you can include in your garden, which are non-native, um, but I think everything within moderation and just making sure that everything can coexist um, is creating a, um, a thriving ecosystem that is biodiverse and resilient. Um, and just something to know is like when you are selecting um, not native plants, you're not just helping the native fungi, but you're also helping the, the native pollinators um, that also thrive within um, those specific niches. Um, and so for example, you like sticky monkey or penstemon, um, ceanothus. Um, ceanothus is really popular by uh, a lot of native tiny bees like tiny carpenter bees or bumblelid flies. Um, they like those tiny little flowers. Um, they like to collect pollen. They might not be um, like bumblelid flies. They have like really long tongues. So they are, they do like to collect the nectar. Um, and so they might really go towards the penstemon. And so if you can choose like California native penstemon, that's gonna be helping those, their native bumblelids or other fl fl um, flies or bees that you might want to bring into your yard and to, to invite them in. Um, if you wanna know a little bit more about uh, native versus non-native plants, um, you can see here within the um, equator between the 30 degree and the 45, um, California lays upon that part, um, lays within um, that part of the equator along with other parts within um, the Medi Mediterranean, um, as we can see here, like um, places like uh, Greece or Italy, um, I know some of my favorite uh, <laughs> um, Mediterranean native plants, maybe they're not specifically niched for California, but they thrive. Um, it's like Jupiter's beard or lavender. Um, olive trees are gonna do really successful in this, this climate as well because of how they have adapted for this region. Um, and Mediterranean climate is characterized by being hot, dry, um, and having like hot, dry summers and then cool, wet winters. Um, and you wanna go with, um, if you are curious a little bit more about what you can select, Master Gardeners have a really great list as well that you can look at. Um, there you go. And we'll be able to share more resources at the end with other plants that you can select. Um, one other thing that you can consider when selecting what plants to include in your, um, your garden is how things are gonna complement one another. Um, so we have our color wheel here, um, and this is a really fun element to consider, like um, purple and yellow are colors that have adapted, um, sorry, adapted over the years to be mutually beneficial. Um, so like pollinators, like bumblebees, they can't see the color red, but they can see the ultraviolet colors um, coming off of the color purple or yellow. And so they really together uh, highlight the other. And so that attracts more pollinators to them. Um, and that helps with plant fertility um, and health and everything like that. So those are some colors that you might want to put together or maybe you think uh, blue and orange go really well together. And so you can select plants that have a really beautiful um, complementary sequence. Um, purple is really calming. And so maybe you'll wanna put um, that into your garden um, and it helps to create balance and dimension, which is also really aesthetically pleasing and creates moods and tones, um, which can encourage you to wanna go out into your garden <laughs> and tracks you as well. Um, some other elements before walking through the full design process is thinking about how are we going to water our beautiful garden? Um, we are firm believers on slow it, spread it, sink it, or store it. Um, you can do this through a variety of different modalities, through like mulching. Um, you can do other limited like uh, hardscaping or more permeable, uh, permeable surfaces through like collecting rainwater. Um, you can use rain barrels or laundry to landscaping. This is a, a really great plug in if you're a Windsor was, uh, resident 
uh, Windsor right now is giving, um, there's an application that you can apply for and there's um, a gray water kit that you can potentially sign up for and win that has like a $150 value. Um, I can include that in with our resources at the end as well. Um, and one other thing to include when talking about um, water, water solutions is you can also do like rain water harvesting or gray water. Um, some people mentioned earlier in the poll that you're interested in uh, rain gardens. And so uh, in our next slide here, this is gonna be an example, the one on the right of a rain garden that helps to uh, collect and filter water. We will be also having a uh, rain garden webinar that uh, you'll be able to see um, in our upcoming events page. Um, and I just wanna lead us so we have enough time for questions. Um, one other feature that I really love for people to consider when thinking about how they wanna design their landscape is alternative pets. <laughs> um, so maybe you wanna have like a chicken coop that you wanna include within your planning. Um, it's really important to consider where you might have shade, right? You don't wanna put your chicken coop right smack dab in the middle where they might not have any shade. Um, or you might wanna strategically plan putting your chicken coop next to your compost bin. So you can feed your chickens the scraps or anything that they don't have. You can just boop, put it in your compost bin. Um, there's worm composting. That's something that I'm doing here in the city right now. That's a lot of fun and easy to do. You can incorporate bird feeders um, or become a beekeeper yourself. Um, there's a lot of holistic great methods that you can do. I've been a beekeeper for the last six or seven years and I just love having bees within um, my backyard space. So, and um, we're gonna go ahead and give some examples from beginning to end um, on looking at Windsor that Connor is gonna talk about. All right. And so, uh, Corey, if you would end your screen share, I'll take it back over so I can do my little laser pointer action. <laughs> All right. Here and... All right. Can we see? Excellent. So, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just take us through an abbreviated version of uh, the design process used for uh, these two home sites that we designed a landscape for in Windsor last year. Um, so we have two home, two families. They're friends. They wanted to design this landscape as one continuous landscape, uh, their, their garden as one continuous landscape. So using our uh, thoughtful observation skills, just noting some things that jump out right away here. Um, and with time, I'm just gonna move kind of quickly through it. So what stands out to me, um, I'm seeing this plum tree and flower so, and a bear, I wanna say that's a silver maple. I can't tell from the bear tree, I'm just remembering. Um, so I'm thinking it's like very late winter or very early spring. I'm seeing a lot of turf. I'm seeing some hardscape along the edge of this turf here. And I'm seeing this dry creek bed. We've got shade coming in from this side. Sometimes you can tell from a picture, but again, I just happen to know north is this direction. So we're looking at probably midday sun over here. Um, so that just gives us some clues on what parts of the garden are going to get shade and when to help us make decisions. So the, after we did a much more detailed series of observations than that, we made a base map. This was early on in using that SketchUp software that I showed you earlier. So my lines aren't exact, but you know this does the job for us. Um, this placement of the plum tree was a little off. You'll see that in the later design as well. But so we just took our satellite image, we made a base map, and then we started talking to the homeowners about what they wanted out of their garden, just like Corey walked us through in the visualization exercise. And so we had this interesting case where we had one person who had really strong ideas about 
what they wanted. They're really interested in landscape design. They had specific plants they wanted to use, specific colors, textures. They had anchor features in mind. They wanted to put in a patio right here. They wanted to add some boulders in the creek bed. Um, and then the other family had, was just totally fine with following that person's vision. Uh, so we took all the feedback that we got from them and we created a first draft. And I actually think this was maybe the second draft, but um, we put together a planting plan. And I wanna say right off the bat, this is a very, very densely planted landscape. Typically I'm not working at this kind of density, um, but these folks knew that this wasn't a landscape that they wanted to be walking through. They wanted to create an atmosphere for somewhere for them to be while they were sitting outside on the patio, maybe some like curb appeal, so to speak. Um, we have a couple anchor features and I, I will show um, photos of what it looks like in just a moment so we can see what it looks like going from design to real life. But we planted a few really um, beautiful manzanitas that will grow to be, um, this one was a variety that'll be maybe 12 feet tall, whereas the one over here, we're looking more like eight to 10 feet. We've got, we ended up not going with a bush poppy back here, but we have another um, anchoring feature to draw the eye through the creek bed. We've got our patio. We used low plants in front and higher in the back to draw the eye. We used sort of a color palette throughout of maroons and burgundies, um, light blue and gray, really bright yellows, and actually some blacks, uh, which I hadn't really worked with in any of designs that I had done before, so that was fun. Um, so we went through another round of feedback with these folks, you know, testing out what this might look like, thinking again after seeing on paper what we were working with, like, oh, actually, you know, I, I want to do something differently. And we, I made a digital design using that same program. And so these circles represent plants at their, you know, their mature growth size. So when we plant this landscape, it's not going to be this dense, but for design purposes, you always want to be considering a plant's maximum size because um, it's, you know, easier to, to prune back than it is to fill gaps. Um, and these colors don't exactly represent the, the blooms or foliage of, of what we were working with, but it was really helpful when we actually went to, to plant to see the differences and how everything was laid out. Um, and I'll, I'll show the plant legend so you can see what we put into this landscape in just a moment. Um, but another sort of disclaimer is there are a fair amount of plants in this landscape that Daily Axe typically doesn't work with. You know, there were a lot of, there are more moderate water use plants than we typically would use. We usually try to do as many very low and low water use plants. Um, we have, uh, we'll share a link for a database called WUCALS, which is the water use classification of landscape species. You can plug in the town in California, this is for California residents, right? But you can plug in the town or city where you live and search for plants and they will tell you the, the water needs. You can search by water needs if you're just like, oh, I'm, I know I want low water use plants. Um, but anyway, just to call out a few features, this is the patio, their seating area, their anchoring feature. And we put in um, sort of lawns of creeping thyme, which is a water wise lawn alternative that flowers beautifully and smells great. Um, it can tolerate some foot traffic. Um, so this is our legend. And some of these uh, didn't make it into the final design or the, the actual planted landscape. We opted against using a bush poppy because we determined that the bush poppy does not like clay soils because it doesn't like wet feet. You know, so knowing, doing our sector analysis at the beginning and knowing that water pools in a certain place, we determined that wasn't a good choice. We went with a native tree mallow instead. Um, some of these species, we have the, the cushion bush. That's an Australian plant. It's actually really wonderful for our climate, but for some reason, isn't very common around here yet. 
which is really hard for us to source from the nursery. We ended up getting it, but it took some time. This variety of fountain grass is very popular around here, and that might be the reason why we actually weren't even able to get our hands on it when the time came to plan. So just kind of underscoring that um, you make your design, depending on your timeline, you may have to improvise and change things up. Um, and just one last one to call out is this Nandina, which is a uh, heavenly bamboo. That's a plant that, you know, typically daily acts does not work with. The homeowner felt very strongly about including it. So we compromised, but this does not fill um, more than one of our big five criteria that we outlined earlier. Uh, depending on who you ask, it doesn't fill any of them. <laughs> Some people don't think it looks that nice. Um, but it's it's not that water wise, it's moderate, uh, it's not edible, it's not medicinal, and in, rather than providing habitat, it can actually um, be dangerous for birds who mistake the berries for an edible species. So just, just wanted to call attention to that because it's very commonly planted and I would advise avoiding it. So uh, I took a couple pictures of this landscape a few weeks ago. And there are a few things I'd want to call out. I apologize, not the best time of day to take a picture. The shade makes it a little hard to see things. But as I mentioned, you know, on the design, those circles show things at their full maturity. Things grow at very different rates. So depending on your budget, you could buy a manzanita that's already four feet out of its 10 feet maximum size of growth that's gonna cost you quite a bit more. So this is our eight to 10 foot manzanita. You can hardly see it. Um, it takes a while to grow. So right now we have these pretty rangy looking pineapple sage, wonderful plant, uh, beautiful, provide, it has a really great smell when you crush it. This variety smells like cantaloupe. Um, it's good for pollinators, specifically like hummingbirds. Um, but it's, it could use a prune. So right now it's almost acting like an anchoring feature, which is not part of the design. Similarly, you can't see our artichoke agave um, in the sea of fescue. So knowing that when you go from design to your planted reality, it may take time for the plants to catch up to your vision, and it may not turn out the way you expect at all. So we have one more angle here where you can see we have another manzanita. This is our time lawn, which I think turned out really nicely. Um, Windsor has been under really strict drought regulations along with Healdsburg. So we're actually really happy with the survival rate of these plants despite that. Um, but, and just to call out a couple last anchoring features before we move on, we have this really very large boulder that you know, kind of captures your attention leading to the seating area. As these plants grow in, you'll have a sort of backsplash of really colorful blooms. Um, we've got the time, another time lawn on the backside and we'll have flowering plants coming up here, uh, which is another point. It was, this photo was taken in winter. So we're not seeing a lot of those lovely colors that we designed for. Uh, so when you're designing, it really helps to consider seasonality. You know, it's great to have something blooming at all times of the year, which we happen to have at our Petaluma library site. So this is a really, really beautiful hand-drawn design. Um, if I had the skill and the patience to make designs like this, I would definitely do it rather than my computerized ones, but that's what works for me. Um, so just again, really high, um, emphasizing there are so many different ways to do it. So, I uh, won't spend too much time here. We've got a rain garden in back. This is the path that we looked at in our earlier photos where we had the really lovely meadow sage and Jerusalem sage, which is the yellow flowers and the hot lip sage, which is a variety of autumn or Texas sage, which were those smaller pink, white and red flowers um, in that side by side of the library we looked at earlier. And so you can see where we had our base map. You can kind of tell the different um, inking here of the base map versus the design. We've got our direction, we've got a legend, really excellent work here. Went from a sheet mulch lawn, and then we have our young version of the garden where things have not really grown in yet. 
which eventually turned into this verdant, abundant, amazing garden that is trying to check as many of those function boxes as possible. So if you go to this garden today, there's actually a statue here in the center of this uh, seating area, as, as well as some complimentary ones off to the side that provide those focal points. We've got food producing plants all over the place. We've got contrasting colors. We have different heights and textures. We've got something blooming every month of the year, which is great for our pollinators. We create a lot of cover. You're not gonna see a lot of bare ground. You will right now, <laughs> the site just got a really heavy prune, um, but typically there's not a lot of open ground, which is really critical for bird habitat. And then all of these plants are water wise. There are very few moderate, plant, moderate water use plants, no high water use plants. We're at the point where we're considering rolling up the irrigation and letting the site um, you know, thrive on its own with just rainfall. A big part of that is our rain garden on the backside here, uh, which I would encourage you to visit this garden and check out. It's a pretty cool um, and well-engineered massive rain garden that stores a lot of water for us. Uh, just to close it out, just looking at a couple different styles of design. Um, I'm gonna keep beating that drum. You can do it so many different ways. It doesn't have to be pretty, but it's nice if it is. Um, you can be really, really complex. Um, and then we're, we're running low on time, so I won't go into detail on the other one. Um, but this was a preliminary design I made you know, kind of chicken scratchy, but it got the job done and we ended up with a beautiful landscape. So uh, I think with that, we can turn it back to Corey for questions and closing slides. I'll go ahead and stop my share. Um, and I see this question in the chat about paid consulting services. Uh, currently, we are not offering paid consulting services, but sometimes we do. Um, we do offer them in Petaluma for folks who qualify for the Mulch Madness program. Um, I'll just share some info on that in the, in the follow-up email for the sake of time, as well as some recommendations for landscape designers who you might uh, look to as consultants. Um, I'll hold it there. Um, yeah, we're happy to spend some time answering some questions. We have about uh, 14 minutes. Um, does anyone, uh, let me wrap up first and I think we have a, a question slide. Um, one thing is uh, we're currently hiring for our bilingual programs coordinator. Um, if you know anyone that might be interested or if you are as well, um, you can go ahead and reach out to one of us or you can go on to dailyx.org slash job openings um, and you can apply there, share it with someone that you think might be interested. Um, and last but not least, I think that will be the last slide is just giving out special thanks. Um, we go ahead and look in our chat box to see if there's any questions. Um, we are in meeting format, so this is a great time if you do want to unmute yourself and to ask a question um, that can be encouraged as well. I saw that um, Bev asked, does it make sense to plant non-natives? They're not part of the family of insects and birds that live here. Right, that's a really great question to ask. Um, I think it's one to um, consider that we live <laughs> in a world now where there's a lot of um, species that have been introduced that are part of our ecosystem that provides, you know, benefits like like honeybees. We we need the honeybees. Um, they are technically invasive species. Um, they don't necessarily outcompete a lot of native pollinators. Um, because they have different food that they like to go towards. So planting, uh, planting a, a large array or diversity in your garden is going to help to create food and habitat for um, animals, whether that be pollinators or birds. 
I see a recommendation from Nancy, which is a great point. That Sonoma County Master Gardeners Garden Sense program is free. They're lovely people with a wealth of knowledge. Um, I just reached out to them today for a question about a project I'm working on. Um, Mimi Enright uh, is, a, is a friend of ours who does a lot of work around um, fire resilient landscapes as well. So um, excellent resource that you should absolutely avail yourselves of. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so if you're, can you just plant right into the cardboard slash compost slash mulch? You, you know, yeah. you cover that whole thing and then you just cut, you basically cut a hole through the cardboard because, you know, it's not going to rain very much more. So it's not going to break down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great question. So at this point in the year, um, with spring on the way, if you were going to sheet mulch now, then exactly, you would basically just push the mulch aside where you're going to plant and use like a box cutter or scissors, whatever. We usually just make like an X to cut through and then you can plant right there. And you definitely wanna make sure that you're planting the root ball in the soil itself rather than the compost and the mulch. Um, yeah, good question. Typically, if you can sheet mulch in the fall, you know, you just leave it for a few months, it composts in place. You know, we use this to, to kill off turf grass and compost it. Um, but, but yeah, at this point, you would probably be planting through the cardboard. Okay. Um, Chris asks, for adobe soil, do you recommend working in amendments prior to layering compo cardboard compost and mulch? Um, yeah, I would do the amendments there because you're starting within the base with the foundation and working up from that. So I would do um, amendment, you, depending on the soil, uh, you can do like 70% existing and like, seven, like 30 to 40% new amendment that you will be including into the, into the soil. Um, but you'll definitely start at that first and then go into the other sequencing process processes. Mm. Bev asked a question about Bermuda grass. <laughs> Seems to grow through everything. Yeah, Bermuda grass is a pest and sheet mulching will not kill it. It will impede it, but because Bermuda grass grows through its rhizomes, it's a very resilient uh, plant that I both admire and really don't love. <laughs> um, so there is a process we use sometimes that is really only effective during the summer called solarization. You basically take a sheet of UV resistant plastic, like six millimeter thick or more, and you wet the area that has Bermuda, you lay the UV resistant plastic on top, and then you basically hold down the edges with rocks or bricks or whatever you have on hand. Um, this is really only going to work in an area that gets a lot of sunlight, like eight to 10 hours or more during the summer. And basically the sunlight will, you know, create steam from where you've wet the soil to kickstart the process and essentially bake the Bermuda grass till it kills it. Even that process is not foolproof. Um, unfortunately, the best method we have for you uh, outside of that is to remove it by hand. Um, it will continue coming back but less so after each round. So we're always looking for better ways to deal with Bermuda that don't rely on uh, synthetic chemicals or fire. <laughs> so if anyone has some, feel free to share it in the chat or follow up with us. Um, I see a question about recommended plants specifically for a rain garden. I think they can be different from the drought tolerant plants. That's true. So rain garden plants are typically, um, they typically are drought tolerant. They're ones that don't mind having wet feet in the winter, fall, winter, and spring months, but will tolerate dry summers. So we have a list of these that we can send in the follow-up email, but um, things like sedges, like native sedges, for example, are really good. Bog sage is a favorite of mine that we have in the Petaluma Library Garden. It can grow like six feet tall and have these beautiful blue flowers. Um, 
a lot of a lot of these grasses, sedges and rushes are go tos. Um, there, there are a lot of options. And then as you go like on the edges of the rain garden, you'll work with more and more drought tolerant plants, things like sticky monkey flower on the kind of the mid ground of the slope. And then on the top, you can even do something like California fuchsia. Um, but like I said, we'll share that resource in the follow up email with our list. I see a question about ornamental grasses. How does Wukals describe them? Um, well, so it, it's just gonna depend species to species. So um, there are ornamental grasses that are really low water use. And then there are those that are not very low water use. And it kind of depends, a, a big differentiating factor is whether it's a native grass or not. So something like, um, deer grass, which is a Mullenbergia, is low water, but there are like pink Mullenbergia, which is native to parts of like eastern Texas, is a moderate, according to Wukals. So it's really a case by case. So if you have specific ornamental grasses that you want to work with, I would just plug them into the Wukals database and see what it comes up with because even within species, it varies. Like I talked about the fountain grass during the design example, there are varieties of fountain grass that are low water use and there are varieties that are moderate. There may even be high water ones, I don't know. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, as is so often the answer in like permaculture and design and science and all that, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, yes, JL Industries is selling plants. Um, I can tell you that in the last couple years, their inventory has gotten a lot smaller and their prices have gone up. Um, not to pick favorites, but I prefer Willowside School Plant Sales. Um, as, a, as a West County person myself, both are pretty near to me, um, but I do love Willowside. Um, so thank you for that suggestion, Diane. Do we have any other questions or any that we maybe missed in the chat earlier? Feel free to, to lift those up again. I'm coming through the chat right now. Great. Bonnie, you're in a new location and first garden. Well, that's exciting. Um, do you, are you looking for general advice or do you have something specific you'd like to know about? What veg shall you plant this spring? My answer is the veggies that you like to eat. That's always my answer. Um, I would look at, it would help to know where you are. Um, if you're in Sonoma County, there's a really great resource called iGrow that has a calendar for when to start seeds indoors versus outdoors, when to plant starts of different varieties on a month by month basis. Um, yeah, Benavel, so perfect. Um, that'll be really helpful. Um, Corey, do you have any, any thoughts? Yeah, so we're starting to think of like, what's gonna be able to tolerate the heat. So like kale, collards, uh, you still have springtime so you can do some lettuces. Um, by gearing up, like tomatoes and peppers are going to begin to to be that season. Um, strawberries, you can do specifically like bare root strawberries right now. This is a great time to plant them into the soil. Um, fava beans, and those do really great this time of the year as well. And just prepping for squashes that are coming. Um, oh, something happened to my thing. Can you all see the sp sponsor? I, yeah, I, I, I think maybe it didn't make it on your file, so I took it over. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I just haven't shared it yet, but thank that's, you. That's right. um, as we are wrapping up, um, let's we can definitely take a moment to acknowledge our amazing sponsors that help to make uh, these events possible and happen. Um, we also want to just thank you all for, for coming out tonight as well. I know Zoom fatigue is a, is a thing, so we had a really amazing turnout. Um, for everyone that, that joined and tuned in tonight. Um, and we're just so happy that we're able to connect. And I know we're all looking forward to the moment where we can have this, what, this workshop in person. <laughs> Is there anything you wish to include, Connor? Um, yeah, just deep gratitude to all of you. I would add that 
we are here to be a resource for you, uh, for our community, both in Sonoma County and well beyond. So if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to email us. Um, and then I saw one last question in the chat and I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> drip lines go onto or under the mulch. So you may have seen in the picture from the Windsor example, they had the drip lines above the mulch. Technically that's not a problem, but best practice is to put mulch on top of the lines because that will protect them from UV rays so they won't degrade as quickly. Less likely someone or a dog might trip over them and cause a leak. And then also you're going to lose less water to evaporation by going under the mulch. So um, you don't have to do it before you mulch. You know, you can always mulch and then when you go back and put in uh, your drip lines, you know, you just either put more mulch or push it aside. And yes, good point, Dana, encourages deeper root growth. All right. And then, yeah, just so you'll get an email from us, but if anything comes up in the meantime, you can reach us uh, at these two email addresses. And, um, you know, we we're a nonprofit. We run on good vibes and donations. If you like what we do, if you're passionate about our mission, which goes well beyond garden design, uh, we would gratefully accept any contributions you're willing to make. Um, and in, Corey, any other closing notes? No, thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming out tonight.